10 years and uh, ended in a matter of, of a few months. A lot of value was destroyed um, and it was a very painful experience to people involved in this matter, but at the same time it was a very enriching experience. And I don't mean in monetary terms, but in terms of the lessons learned and the new horizons that it has opened. Um, and uh, finally, one very positive side effect of all that is that I can finally check my mobile phone without a fear of seeing AOG messages uh, on it. Um, so, um, Brave Explorers was one of the driving uh, values of Small Planet. Uh, we were always looking for the new uh, markets to go to, uh, new product and service ideas, uh, and the new also business models um, uh, to implement. And speaking uh, of a business model, just to remind uh, uh, you what it was, so Small Planet was a, a charter airline, and uh, we were serving uh, uh, we were providing uh, aircraft capacity to the tour operators in Europe during the summer season and then in winter season we were migrating uh, part of our fleet uh, to Asia uh, as a counter seasonal business. So uh, in 2018 we were at roughly uh, 30 aircraft fleet sites and on the European side it was scattered across uh, Lithuania, Poland, Germany France and UK, and then on the Asian side, we were working with our clients in Saudi Arabia, India, and Cambodia. How did we do? Um, just to remember some uh, uh, numbers. So on the top line, we did uh, exceptionally well. We grew the business eightfold in a matter of eight years. So from 50 million in revenue uh, back in 2011, up to 400 million uh, in 2018. Now, when you look on the bottom line, the story is uh, slightly more volatile here. Uh, we had uh, two negative years in the very beginning, uh, which was followed by a management buyout in 2013. And uh, since that time, we did exceptionally well, having three years of consecutive uh, growth with an absolute uh, record year in 2015. Then 16 came and we, we were in the first uh, crisis when four 821s were severely delayed uh, during the delivery process. We bounced back in 17, uh, but with a much smaller uh, profitability margins. And then 18 came, boom, and we had, uh, we racked up a 31 million uh, loss in a matter of uh, 90 months, which uh, put the company into the ground. So what happened there? Um, 28 of that 31 million was attributable to our German expansion. So, so something went terribly wrong uh, with our expansion in Germany. And then again, majority of that 28 million of a loss in Germany was accruals against uh, the, the famous uh, and beautiful EU 261 uh, law that we have out there. Uh, so why did we have such losses in Germany? Uh, the reason is very simple. Um, we had 6% of all flights in Germany which were delayed by more than three hours and hence the uh, compensation uh, charges against the EU 261 which we had to approve. Now, why do we have such uh, extensive delays? A uh, couple of reasons. Uh, first, we had a crew lag. Uh, we were having a super intensive utilization in Germany where we used the aircraft roughly 500 hours uh, a month. And we also had a lot of uh, irregularities in terms of aircraft being unavailable, <coughs> either because uh, we were having AFG issues or because um, we were having some uh, delivery uh, issues or uh, because we had some third parties which were not so reliable uh, providing services to us. So this, this, this was happening in Germany, 6% of all flights uh, delayed, uh, huge compensation charges uh, and this uh, puts the company um, uh, to a stop. So lessons learned from this uh, experience. Now I had a unique opportunity uh, because about six months have passed already since uh, this happened, so it was a time to, to look uh, back and to reflect of what really uh, happened there. 
and to try to make some sense out of it. And what I will try to do also, I will share uh, some of the lessons learned and perhaps they could be of value to you guys here as well. So starting with the first one. Uh, so small planet was killed by too much growth. So how much to grow? That is the question. Uh, so collapse of Air Berlin in Germany back in 2016, uh, no, 17. It opened up us uh, a huge possibility because we were already present in Germany at that time and the tour operators uh, in that market uh, started knocking on our doors and asking for more capacity. So obviously we were faced with the question of how much to grow and uh, we looked at the typical growth constraints. Uh, are we going to source the aircraft in the market? Are we going to have enough money to, to lease those aircraft and to pay for the deposits? Uh, are we going to be able to find uh, enough crews uh, to, 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 to fly on those aircraft? So these were the growth constraints which we have looked at in our board. We discussed them extensively and we arrived at a number of aircraft which we felt we are comfortable to add provided these growth constraints. But we didn't look at something else. We didn't look at what I call now soft uh, growth constraints, uh, such as is the core team really engaged? Do they still eager and hungry to do this growth and, and to be in the business? And as you will see a little bit later on from my further slides, that there were some uh, interesting team dynamics happening there, which, uh, so the answer actually was no to that question. The other one, are the risk owners really experienced? Because in our uh, decision to grow in Germany, we clearly identified that crew lack is going to be the number one issue which we have to deal with. However, the people who were responsible for the crew process uh, were quite inexperienced. And we as management, I as the leader of the company, we just left it at that. Uh, again, was the organization running well? We had some friction between the different uh, countries uh, to cooperate and also maintenance area was not running uh, very well. However, we didn't really ask uh, these uh, uh, things to ourselves when we were making uh, this decision to grow in Germany and we just, uh, we just basically uh, left it at that. So if I was ever in a situation again where I need to uh, uh, make a decision by how much to grow, I would try to look not only at the hard constraints, such as the first three, but also to consider what are the soft constraints for that growth on the people side, on the, on the organizational side. And if there are issues there, perhaps then those growth ambitions should be put down a little. Um, number two. Um, it's, it's quite natural that after 10 years, some people in the core team want out. They are no longer eager to be in this uh, demanding business. They have some other things uh, going on and they want out. However, when such people came up to me and, and said that they would like to be out, I did not let them go. I, I pretty much held them, well, you could say a hostage. Uh, because. You know, I wanted maybe to leave myself also, and now this guy, he, he can go and I have to stay? No, it's not fair, so you have to stay with me also. So I did this, and uh, that's something which I wouldn't do again. So if I would ever be in a, such a situation uh, again, I would let such people go, because in hindsight it now seems quite obvious that, that without the proper motivation in their hearts, uh, such people, you cannot rely on them when you are, when you are in, a, in a high expansion phase where everybody really needs to be focused. So if I was in this situation again, no matter how painful that would be, I would actually uh, let such people go and then deal with that uh, appropriately. Number three, um, Small Planet had quite a complex business model. We had multiple AOCs in uh, Lithuania, Poland, Germany, Cambodia. We had seasonally migrated fleet um, between Europe and Asia. We have very tailored uh, charter programs individually uh, done for each uh, customer. And on top of all that complexity, we were putting scale. So what I found out is that when you do that, when you put scale on top of complexity, you 
give birth to, to this monster, which uh, you no longer manage. You no longer manage this business. It actually manages you. You are very much in a firefighter position, trying to extinguish all the fires which are happening, and uh, you, you don't really control it that much. It starts to, to control uh, you a bit. So again, if I will ever be in a situation, a uh, similar situation again, um, I would look for establishing the business model first and then scale it. So just do the basically opposite of what we did at Small Planet. <coughs> Number four, uh, speaking about the organizational structures and especially about the matrix organizational structure. So again, uh, when we were Starting in the very beginning, in our first years, we had the traditional hierarchy, the one you see here on the left, where things are run very smoothly and very simply. You have a leader on the top, some functional managers, and all is clear. Then as we have expanded to other countries, into Poland, into Germany, into Cambodia, we moved to the so-called uh, two-dimensional matrix. Uh, so, and matrix systems are notoriously uh, uh, complex and they have issues, such as, for example, you may have people who have two bosses. So who, who is really uh, in charge of me, let's say, if, if I'm somewhere lower on an on a organization uh, map. Then you may also have uh, kind of a, a conflicting between the headquarters and the remote offices and all kinds of other difficult uh, issues which actually are quite universal with the uh, matrix systems. And we tried to mitigate that. We tried to mitigate that going even further by introducing a three-dimensional matrix. And actually, it uh, worked quite well, but it was slow uh, to work. It, we needed much more time to really uh, make it work further. And uh, actually, there were people in my uh, leadership team uh, and some other echelons of the organization who would actually come and say, you know what? Matrix system is just not for me. I cannot, I cannot figure out really how I should be doing things in, in, in this uh, matrix organizational system. So uh, actually this, this uh, organizational system of ours was really eating up some of our people alive. So again, if I would ever be in an organization where, which is run with a matrix organizational system, and this is quite usual when you grow and expand to other different regions, uh, two things which I would be looking for is that I would give as little autonomy and power to the remote offices as possible and I would try to have as strong people in the headquarters as possible to, to manage across. Going further and speaking of uh, uh, big ambitions, um, in Small Planet uh, we had uh, an ambition to reach 1 billion uh, euro in revenue by 2025. Uh, because we thought it's, it will be an exciting uh, size uh, to have an airline of this size uh, out of Lithuania. Uh, there was some, some kind of a pride uh, in that. And, uh, and we calculated that in order to reach that goal we need to add roughly about 5-6 aircraft every year. <coughs> And we were doing it, and, and with this kind of a goal, we have programmed ourselves into what I call perpetual growth. Um, but growth is not always fun. Actually, quite often, it's quite painful. And, uh, and you, you, may, you may no longer, at, in, in the middle of this path, you, you might have different thoughts. Maybe you're no longer so eager to go for this uh, big ambition. So we were, we were feeling in 2017, a little bit like this uh, uh, mountain climber who is uh, trying to reach his peak, but then on the middle of the path, I mean, something happens, maybe to his psychology or, or the weather conditions are not right, and he, he, it would be wise for him to perhaps take a break uh, or do something else, but instead of that, he just continues climbing. So this is what we a little bit did uh, back in 2017 when we took this decision uh, to grow uh, in, in Germany because intuitively many of us at the table during the board meeting felt that this is not right. Something is not right. We shouldn't, shouldn't be going after it. But since we have had this goal and we were programming ourselves that growth is good, we need to continue, we need to reach this goal and a certain number of aircraft need to be added every year in order to go there, we just went for it. We, we basically convinced ourselves that we have to grow. So again, 
in future, if I'm ever to chase big ambitions again, and it's, uh, I, I like to think that uh, I will be doing that in the future again, one thing which I would like to make sure that I am chasing those big ambitions because I want to and not because this is something which is written uh, on the wall in our corporate offices. What do you really want from your business? Do you want to sell it? Or maybe you want to grow and nurture it? Or perhaps you want to step back? And for me, up to a point, it was absolutely clear what my priorities are. Until 2015, I was all in to grow the business, to nurture it. And then in 2015, I thought, ah, well, I've done quite well, maybe I will step back a little bit. So I stepped back, I moved to Thailand uh, together with my family, also to explore some uh, Asian opportunities there. And then in 16, uh, a crisis came. Uh, we had late delivery of 4 to 21 huge mess, so I have to move back from Thailand, so I need to step, uh, well, not back, but step in, right, into the business. And then at that point in time, uh, I was no longer really clear what, what, I, what I wanted to do in terms of, of these choices, because I wasn't feeling very well growing that business uh, from that point in time and nurturing it. I couldn't step back because uh, there was a crisis going on and I convinced myself that I need to be in the company. And at the time I also started to, to, to look for potential buyers or investors into the company, but again, I wasn't firmly sure that this is something that I really want to do. So I was a little bit lost amongst those uh, uh, three options. So again, in the future, if I'm ever uh, in a situation, a similar situation again, I think it's quite important to get your head right and to make sure which kind of a thing you really want uh, from these three and then to, to go for it uh, from there. Uh, coming back a little bit to our decision <coughs> to go in Germany, which was taken by our board on one sunny day uh, in, in Vilnius uh, back in the 2017. So we had eight people board and uh, around the table in our board meeting we have two uh, growth proponents who are very eager to chase this uh, opportunity which presented itself after Air Berlin collapsed. We have two skeptics which don't want to do it, which actually want to be out from the business. They are tired, they want to do something else. Uh, you have one guy there on the right hand of the, of the uh, table who is uh, inexperienced, so he is a little bit puzzled about what is really going on here in the first place. And then on the left side you have me, who is uh, kind of a lost amongst those three options, what he really wants to do uh, uh, in, that, in, in that business. So in this kind of a setup, uh, we, we took a decision to go for this growth in Germany at a little bit lower scale than our uh, proponent, proponents of, of uh, German growth uh, have wanted. But still we were not uh, comfortable uh, with that kind of decision. And again, you cannot be 100% comfortable with all your business decisions. That's just not realistic. You will never be in, in that position. But still, I mean, when you have this gut feeling that, that something is, 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 is not really happening right, and instead of actually taking more time uh, to think it through, what we did, we just rushed with this decision. We just rushed it, we thought, okay, let's just get it done and over with. It's better to decide quickly now and move on with the implementation than to uh, procrastinate and, and further uh, think uh, through all the possible uh, growth scenario options. So in the future, if I ever have to take uh, a big business growth decision again, and uh, there is this feeling in the gut that uh, something is not happening entirely right, I would like to be able to step back a little and maybe in a week or so to get back into that same board meeting room again and to try to take some fresh perspective. Maybe nothing will come out of it, maybe the decision will be the same, or maybe there will be some kind of a other smarter uh, way forward. And actually, in hindsight, uh, I think that uh, we missed uh, a certain uh, way how we could have grown in Germany differently, in a much we have smarter way, and we didn't find that way because we were not even looking for it. We just rushed uh, with the decision in order to get it over the with and move on. So I think in the future, 
when you have this feeling in the gut, it's wise to step back a little, try to take some fresh perspective and see if maybe you can find out some other alternatives uh, which, which overall team would be more um, sure of. And number eight, um, this was the structure of our group. And the uh, failure in Germany um, uh, became the failure of the whole group. Why? Uh, it was so because uh, the group was issuing cross guarantees for all its subsidiaries. Now, why were we doing that? <coughs> because we wanted to grow fast. We could have chosen another way. We could have decided, as we were planning to make our uh, setup in, in Germany, that we will not be issuing uh, cross guarantees uh, from the group uh, level. We could have done that. Uh, what would, what, would, what would have been in that case is that the growth in Germany would have been much slower uh, because we would not be, have been able to add uh, aircraft as quickly as uh, we wanted to. So we wanted to grow fast. And uh, somehow this decision to grow fast was not even a conscious choice. This was like somehow uh, a default option. So I think again that uh, in, in the future, I think uh, when I am going through some kind of a growth scenarios in other businesses again, I would like to be able to make a conscious choice. Does this business have to grow fast? Or perhaps I just want it to grow uh, to a certain level? Or maybe it can even grow at its own pace as some kind of opportunities arise without having some pressure uh, for, for, for this uh, let's say ambition that you're chasing or some kind of a growth target that, that you may have there. And I think a conscious choice would, uh, would be much better than just a, a default option like it was in our case. Okay, so these are the eight things uh, that I had to share with you. And just um, yesterday, I was thinking um, how to summarize this uh, all for you in some kind of a way that hopefully you could take something uh, back with you. And I have came up with this uh, diagram, which uh, starts from growth. And um, how, how should I or you also perhaps could be thinking in the future about the growth questions. What kind of an algorithm you could apply when you have the growth question in front of you? So I think one thing to start with is just to remember that growth is not necessarily always fun. It actually can be a lot of pain and sometimes it can even kill, like it was in the case of uh, small planet. So the first, I think, good question to ask uh, is, do you really have to? Uh, because some businesses perhaps really have to. Uh, in a technology sector where you have innovations, you have to achieve the so-called escape velocity. You need to just go as fast as can, burn a lot of millions of investor money, just to take off quickly and to leave the competition basically irrelevant, to leave them far aside. But in many other businesses perhaps you don't have to. So I think this is, this is a good question to discuss in your management teams. What kind of a situation are you in? Do you have to grow or, or perhaps uh, not so much? And if you have to, then you know, not much I can tell you. No, good luck, <laughs> do it, uh, go ahead. Uh, but if you don't have to, um, there is another question which I think uh, would be wise to ask. Do you really want it? And, or perhaps do you still want it? If you have had a, uh, an ambition to grow a lot in the past and now you're in the middle of it, do you still want it? And if the honest answer is no, well then, I don't know, maybe you should fire yourself or, or you know, at least find some other priorities, what you will do instead of growth or, or you know, step back perhaps. Uh, and I think again, realistically, taking a no path here is going to be quite difficult uh, because you will always be, ah, maybe I want to grow, Maybe I don't, so I think we will be leaning towards a, a yes outcome here anyways. So if, if that is the case uh, with your growth decision, then there are three important checkpoints I think to note. So first, choose your growth pace and remember the soft factors. It's not only the, the hard factors which you have to, to, to think about, but also the soft factors like people and the organization which you have in place. Second thing, choose your growth risk uh, profile, basically. Uh, remember the black scenario. Uh, think about what is the worst case scenario and then try to decide uh, whether it's absolutely for you to, to go for this fast 
all in kind of a growth, or perhaps you can afford some kind of a lower, more sustainable pace with some kind of a, a black, nasty uh, scenario in mind in case uh, something happens. And the third thing is uh, stop and rethink if you feel rushed. Because uh, sometimes you may have this tendency, we have this human nature that when we are facing a difficult decision, we want to just go and take it and just move on quickly. So if you are aware of such a uh, tendency uh, growing in you, um, uh, I think it would be very wise just to try to stop a little, uh, not rush, and then try to get some kind of a uh, fresh perspective in there. And then, good luck. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions? Now you mentioned that you do not necessarily have to grow. Considering the quite frequent bankruptcies that we have seen among small and medium airlines recently, do you think that this business model of a small or medium-sized airline is viable at all in, in the current industry environment? And would you do it again? Well, to answer the second part, uh, I, I'm not planning to do it uh, for the foreseeable future, but again, you never know. Uh, it, it, if I would be called upon, uh, I might do it, but I will be doing something else now. And coming back, is this business model viable? Um, well, uh, you know, if you look into the States, into, into the US, what happened with the airline industry there, and if you apply the same uh, uh, sort of a pattern to Europe, then the answer would be no, because there's no, there's very, very few small airlines left in the United States. Uh, there has been a huge process of consolidation, and now finally, as you, as you have seen in a, in a, in a presentation uh, before, uh, the North American uh, aviation sector is uh, massively profitable, and even Warren Buffett, who was such a uh, uh, avoider of airline stocks before, has invested in, in, I think, three or four American airlines. So, so it, if the same is happening in Europe, and it's quite likely that it will be happening, and we have seen that there are so many uh, small and medium players which have been going out of business, uh, um, you know, so, so this is going to likely continue uh, in Europe. And I think there will be more uh, 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 bankruptcies uh, amongst uh, uh, different airlines. Uh, and you have seen already so many of them during the last couple of months in Germania, our biggest competitor in Germany, when bus, Primera, I mean, what not. And in, in a couple of weeks, uh, quite likely, you will, you will see uh, one more uh, quite uh, big one. So, yeah, uh, a lot of things are happening. But is it ne does it necessarily mean that there is no business model uh, for such uh, small and medium-sized airlines? I think there's still a, a, a quite a good niche. Uh, today, this niche in, on, on the ACMI side, uh, because there's a huge uh, shortage of uh, capacity in Europe, so on the ACMI business, you would have good opportunities. Um, tour operators uh, are still in business. Uh, they have not died, as many uh, people have been saying that they will die, so they will need capacity, so there will be still a need for some charter airlines. And again, even from small plant figures, uh, you have seen that we have had quite a few very good years uh, where the business model was working. Uh, but we, we overextended it a little bit. Uh, we just uh, tried to, to hit the gas to the floor and see how fast we can go. And uh, the other time, the, the next time, if I was ever to do it again, uh, God forbid now, but uh, then I would, of course, probably think at least uh, for some kind of uh, other ways of doing it and uh, growing it at a slightly slower pace. And then I think, for 10 years still, there will be some good money to be made uh, on, on this kind of a business if the setup is right. Thank you for that great presentation. Um, there's still so much space for innovation in the industry. You know, from your perspective today, are there other areas of the business um, outside of like starting up a new airline that you see a great need for change? You mean some kind of innovations outside of aviation? Or outside of airline, maybe like on the maintenance side or another part of you know, something that would enhance our existing work. Well. 
Well, since this is a MRO conference, uh, maybe it's uh, uh, a good place to, to, to say how actually I feel about the maintenance area in general. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, um, I, I think that, uh, well, maintenance area for me uh, throughout all of those years remains uh, sort of a black box. I mean, it, it's, it's something which, uh, which uh, you open up and you, you want to close it as soon as possible. I mean, uh, first of all, you don't really fully, you absolutely don't control what is going on there. Well, okay, maybe I, I need to choose my words uh, more carefully, but, but you're, you're it, it's very unpredictable, uh, and if you're doing many things yourself, um, your budgeting will be always uh, with huge variations. I mean, when you sit in a month of management meetings, you go through your expenditures, you have most of the lines where you are like, you know, you, you, you get them right, you are able to predict, and then it comes to maintenance and boom, I mean, there's just some kind of a massive variation. Uh, so, so, so that is an, is an issue which at least I saw in our uh, company from the position um, where I was seeing it from. The other thing, uh, uh, maintenance, uh, I mean the AOGs, I, I, I could never uh, get over them. I know plenty of uh, airline CEOs uh, who just accept that this is a, a part of the business and they are completely uh, like uh, unemotional about that. It was not the case for me. I was getting those AOG messages and every time when I get one I know that there is like hundreds of passengers who you know, are getting their vacations screwed uh, because uh, the airline is not departing on time and you, you feel that uh, negative emotion on you. So some people can uh, take it aside and just uh, leave it there. Uh, for me, this, this was not the case. I was always very frustrated by those AOGs. And especially I was frustrated by, by the fact that they, they are, again, very much unpredictable. Uh, they just happen. It's, it's, you can be prepared, uh, you can do certain things, but uh, there's only very limited things of what you can do and it will continue to happen and you will never eradicate them. And they will hit you at uh, times uh, when, well, they, they have a tendency to hit you at that time. <laughs> so yeah, maintenance area was, was something uh, which um, I, I, I think we, we did not uh, get uh, fully right uh, in Small Planet. And again, this is not maybe universal for all maintenance area, maybe this is a very specific experience uh, in our case. We did change uh, two or maybe even three uh, technical directors over those years. Uh, paying more and more salary to them, thinking that we are getting uh, better and better people. And they were very good people. I mean, they were uh, doing obviously many good things. And we have uh, insourced uh, M, um, part M145 uh, uh, to do all the engineering in house in order to be more in control with all the engineering things which we were doing. And that we were uh, thinking about the next step to also do this uh, on the line maintenance side, just to have more control. Uh, so in case, you know, shit happens, at least we know that this is uh, of our own making. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I, ne I never had a, a, a comfortable relationship with maintenance. And uh, I don't know exactly what needs to be done there, but I'm pretty sure that if somebody would have come up to me uh, at, uh, at some point in time and would have said, look, I know you have maintenance headaches, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, I would have listened. Uh, because uh, immediately with, with that statement, uh, somebody would have grabbed my attention that they can, of course, they need to then provide some kind of a solution for it. Um, but, but this was always uh, an area which I thought uh, more can, can be done. What exactly? I mean, it's up for you guys to, 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 think, to think what it is. Any other questions? Uh, uh, it's, it's even painful to watch, you know, I think it's like a cleansing <laughs> process for you psychologically. Uh, question relating to the one which we just, uh, the topic that you just covered on the maintenance side. Seems like a lot of these um, issues were internal, um, like internal operational, let's call them, you know, like the delay of certain A321 deliveries and things like that. And you were saying that you never got the grips on the on the maintenance side, which are really a lot of them are operational as well. So was the organization open, really genuinely open for someone to sit at the board table and say, guys, no, I mean, just no, let's slow down. And operationally, maintenance-wise, 
if you guys claim that the aircrafts will arrive one month from now, they will arrive based on experience on any redeliveries, they will arrive five months from now and, and things like that. So do you think the organization was ready actually to take the take the negative um, break on this deal or was it so pre-programmed to go as 300 kilometers an hour and, and no one could stop it? Yeah, like I said before, I think we were kind of a program. We did program ourselves to go at, at fast speeds uh, um, and even, but at the same time when we did that, we were trying to do many different things in, in the maintenance uh, area. You know, changing people, changing processes, uh, bringing in uh, new systems and, and so on and so forth. So, I, I'm not sure if I'm getting your question right. So, so if, if we were open as an organization to do changes in our maintenance organization, is, is that basically what you're asking? I mean, we were open, but, <laughs> or is it not? I mean, I, I see from your face that we have to do something different. No, no, so if you had a very, very strong technical person in the board uh, who actually did kind of have a different opinion about the growth in Berlin, in, in, in Germany, uh, who had a different opinion about uh, when the aircraft will be delivered, which you're already planning for the next summer season, uh, was the organization ready to listen to this opinion? Oh, okay. Uh, well, you know, we are a board of eight people and we were trying to, to talk through and, and see and listen to all the uh, arguments which all the different people amongst the, around the table were saying. And at the very end, uh, the decision was a good decision and anybody uh, could have said that, uh, you know, no, I'm, I'm against this, I'm not going to do it. So, so what did happen is that uh, by listening to all of these uh, different people around the table uh, expressing their opinions, we arrived at a, a decision which was basically not comfortable for majority of us. And, and those people who were kind of on the skeptic side, they were not forceful enough perhaps to, to really say, no, we are not going to do this, uh, this is wrong, and here, here's the reason why. They were also like skeptics, but, but, but they were saying, yeah, well, we, we can still do it, but it will be difficult. And, and what do you do as a leader when you hear talk like that? Yeah, come on, you can do it, you know, go on, let's just uh, all together, we will make this happen. So, so you somehow talk yourself into it. So, so this kind of a consensus uh, decision at that point in time, I don't think this was a, a very good thing. And then, like I said also, we, we, were, we very much rushed with this decision. I, as a, as a leader in that meeting, as a, as a, as a you know, chairman of the board, I clearly sensed that the uh, majority of us are not comfortable uh, with this decision that we have taken. Uh, uh, to grow a lot uh, in Germany and uh, instead of going back maybe in a week's time and to try to find some fresh perspective we just rushed uh, with that decision all of us. Why? Because it's easier. It's easier just to go on and start uh, implementing because then you are already uh, doing something. You are no longer procrastinating. Okay, thank you.